So I'm going to introduce Kim. Now, Kim is noted here as a storage manager and he's presenting at the moment as the, the storage manager. He wears two hats and I remember a couple of years ago we put two, gave him two different hats, a red and a green one I think, to try and differentiate the two but today Kim is presenting as a storage manager initially and that's uh, a position, and Kim can explain it better than me, but it's a position of appointment made by the Minister um, even though he sits in our building and gets his salary from us, um, that is a role that he fulfils as well as being a manager of water resources, which is another title he holds in Melbourne, uh, sorry, GWM yes, Water. So he doesn't get paid twice, but he's got two jobs. Um, Thanks, Adele, and thanks, Andrew. And I, I think Andrew's um, summarised my role quite well, so I, I won't go into that um, too much more. But I'll get right into the presentation. And I, I'm feeling a bit of deja vu because I recall talking about dry conditions in this room um, some time ago. Meanwhile, it was drizzling outside as it is today. Uh, but I'll, I'll go back now um, into 2020. So um, looking at rainfall in July to September, which is right coming into our main inflow period. So what we saw is that in our rainfall through July to September was well below average. On this slide, I've got a, a uh, blue box sort of uh, representing where the Grampians catchment areas are for our main reservoirs. And we saw rainfall in that period that was between 60% and 80% of average. Um, as you imagine, our, our inflows to reservoirs in that same period were also well below average. Um, fortunately, as we got to October, we had quite good rainfall right across our catchment areas, um, well above average but that well above average rainfall only got us average inflow for that month. And almost half the inflow that we've received since July was in October alone. So that was a really important month in terms of setting us up for the year ahead, um, in terms of our volumes and storage inflows and um, broader water security. So moving on from our winter spring period, as you'd expect in most years, uh, February to April is generally a warm, dry time of year not a lot of rainfall. Um, the difference between April this year and April in 2020 is that rainfall in April 2020 was well above average. So that meant that we had a lot of water soaking into our catchments, they were getting wet, they were getting primed, and that started to set us up for the winter and spring periods. As you'll be well aware, April's been quite dry right across the region. The month of May to date, again, has been quite dry. And by virtue of that, we haven't seen very much in at all since that October rainfall event. So what that means for our water storages, uh, inflows from the end of July to the end of April, just shy of 65,000 megalitres, which is around 34% of the historic average for that same period. So nearly half of that inflow was in October alone, and 50% of the total inflow we received since July was to Rockland's Reservoir, so one out of our nine major reservoirs. And as I mentioned, very, very little inflow to our reservoirs since October, and that's a combination of below average rainfall and also warmer, dry conditions through summer, as you'd expect. So how does this look in a historical context? And what I've got <coughs> on this slide is all our inflow years from wettest year on the left to driest year on the right. Um, What's really interesting is that we've got some coloured bars in here. They show years where we've had inflow above <coughs> average, inflows below average, or inflows um, sort of between half <coughs> and full average. So they're coloured in red, orange, and green. There's no orange bars on this chart. Um, for some of the room, it might be a bit hard to see, but we do have quite a few red bars denoting years where inflows have been less than 50% of average, and only two green bars and these are looking at years since 2010 where we've had inflows above average. So in the last 20 years, we've had two above average inflow years. And they're really important for securing our, our water, our water supply, because that's what tops up our reservoirs and keeps us going through dry periods. Where we're tracking, right down this dry end, once again, um, similar to where we were in terms of inflows <coughs> last year and also in 2014-15 year. So we've been sitting right down that try end of the inflow scale. This is our fourth year where inflows to reservoirs have been 35% of average or less. 
So we went from 26 <coughs> 2017, where we had above average, to four years back to back of really low inflows. Now I've transformed these inflows. <coughs> I'll go to a question in the back. So the reason that those inflow charts exclude Taylor's Lake and Tolondo Reservoir is that Tolondo doesn't have much of a natural catchment of itself, so it's highly dependent on water from Rocklands, and we don't want to double count that inflow. Similarly for Taylor's Lake, because we've got a lot of control as to how and where we can move water towards Taylor's Lake, we exclude that to not influence the statistics. Um, so when we talk about total inflow volumes, we do count Taylor's Lake, but when we compare it in a statistical <coughs> context, we just exclude that to avoid skewing the figures. So looking at how those inflows have played out since 1950 to present, you notice that um, through 1950 to the mid-1990s, there's quite a bit of variability in wetter inflow years and lower inflow years, so higher and lower blue bars <coughs> on this chart. And what I've done is look at the frequency that we receive inflows. And historically, we would receive a very, similar in, a very similar volume of inflow every nine or so years, give or take. And this has been a really consistent pattern from the 1950s right through to the mid-1990s. So we would see an average inflow of around 2,100 gigalitres every nine years. Interestingly, in the last 24 years, we haven't actually got to that same inflow volume. So what that's telling us <coughs> is that in 24 years, or over two and a half times duration, we haven't got the same inflow that we used to get historically. So we're going from this inflow volume every nine years to now potentially 25 years to get that same volume. What's not changing in recent times is evaporation. So our reservoirs are still evaporating. Our rates of evaporation aren't necessarily going down but we've got less water coming into those storages to balance out those losses. So that's why when we look at volumes in storage, they still decline over time, even though we've got, um, we've got a pipeline system, so we're taking a lot less water out of the reservoirs. But with less water coming in, quite constant rates of evaporation, we're still seeing a decline through those dry periods. And that's what I've got on this next slide, which shows how our reservoir volumes have performed over the last few years. The highest um, two lines on that chart are 2016-17, so that's the last above average inflow year we've seen. Um, and, and since then, it's really been a year-on-year -year drawdown on the volume in storage by virtue of those below average inflows, by virtue of that consistent evaporation from those reservoirs, and obviously um, water supply from those reservoirs as well. So at the present time, we're sitting just below 29% in storage. It's actually quite similar to where we were at the same time in 2019. And that's not surprising given that, given that the inflows we've seen for this year so far have been quite similar to the inflows that we saw for the 2019-20 year. So to put these volumes in context in a bit more of a statewide perspective, I've put a bit of a comparison of where our Grandkins Reservoir sit at 29% um, say compared with some of the Goulburn Murray storages, Melbourne Water, Colburn Water and Central Highlands Ballarat storages. What you'll notice is that the Grampians reservoirs have the lowest percentage in storage out of that mix. And that might sound a bit alarmist, but it's important to consider that those reservoirs have a huge amount of storage compared to the volume that we now supply from them. And that storage is what provides that security and allows us to harvest lots of water in wetter years to ride out those dry years. And we really do need that because like Melbourne, who has the desal plant, we don't have that extent of alternate supply. We don't have um, super pipes like Bendigo and Ballarat have access to. So we're reliant on those reservoirs and the storage of those reservoirs and the security that that storage provides to make sure that we can ride out these four or five, maybe more dry year sequences. So having a look at what we had in storage, and this is starting in November, and I'll transition this slide to May in a moment. In <coughs> November, we had around 227,000 megalitres in our reservoirs. And that water was allocated to a range of uses, um, consumptive users, including GW water for towns and farms, component in there for environment, environmental flows, 
a very large component, this blue bar, 57.5 gigalitres of reservoir and headwork system losses. So that's evaporation that I was talking about previously and also the losses that we incur moving water between storages and to, to deliver that water to water users. Now, if I skip this slide to May, you will notice that there's quite a decrease in both sets of bars. And since November, the decline in storage volume has been 65,000 megalitres. So that's quite, quite a significant volume. And a large share of that, so around 45,000 megalitres of that 65,000, has been evaporation loss from the storages. So the remainder is water that's supplied to water users. Now this is important because we have a lot of reservoirs which provide a lot of security. They also have a lot of surface area. So with that surface area, there's a lot of evaporation. So there's a lot of factors in this water supply, water demand, water security mix. But evaporation is something that we have to manage and keep an eye on very closely. And as the water that's available in our storages gradually declines, um, gets contracted, there becomes more importance on holding water in the most efficient reservoirs. So we've got reservoirs that have quite small surface area for the volume they hold, like Lake Belfield. We also have reservoirs that have a very, very large surface area for the volume they hold, like Lake Lonsdale. So as you'll see, if you do happen to look at our reservoir levels uh, on the Storage Magic website from time to time, there are reservoirs that are holding um, quite good volumes at the present time. Some reservoirs, and specifically the ones with the bigger surface areas, they tend to be holding the lowest volumes in storage. And a large factor in that is the evaporation loss from those reservoirs. So we, we have to focus on keeping water in the most efficient locations. So if we were to move water, say, from a very, very efficient storage to a, a storage with very, very high evaporation, that water will, majority, just evaporate straight up with little benefit to recreation users, little benefit to water users. So it's quite a complex balance that we have to, that we have to weigh up each year. And um, the decisions we make get more, I guess, difficult as things get drier and as we have lower volumes in storage. But those decisions become particularly important in dry times to make sure we do have water security for towns, for farms and for the region. Taking a snapshot at water allocation, so this is um, at the bulk entitlement level. Our Wimmera Mallee Pipeline product, so that's what geothermal water uses for towns and farms, um, what environmental water holders also have access to. That's sitting at 57% at the current point in time. Given that um, catchments are quite dry, not a huge amount of rainfall forecast, I'm not expecting that these will increase um, before the end of June and that's when our water year resets and, um, and we start our accounting year again. Um, what we do have in here, just acknowledging that the GW Water Board underwrote um, the pipeline supplied recreation lakes uh, for this water year, given that there was no allocation able to be made. And that's by virtue of low inflows. If inflows to reservoirs are low, if they're below average, then water allocations across the board um, become restricted and we can't make full allocations to, to the range of entitlements um, that have access to our reservoirs. I'll move into a bit of an outlook, so starting with the immediate um, two-week period. If you do look on the Bureau's website today, this has changed a little bit um, in the recent days. But looking for the two weeks um, as of a couple of days ago now, we're looking at a quite low chance of exceeding the median rainfall. And I've put on this slide, the median rainfall for that two week period for our Grampians catchments is about 20 to 30 millimetres. 20 to 30 millimetres with where our catchments are in terms of dryness is not gonna start generating any runoff. Realistically, I would expect rainfall of 60 to 70 millimetres before we start to see good runoff and good inflows to our reservoirs. So we do have quite a way to go. In terms of the month um, ahead, June, the Bureau is indicating a 60 to 70% chance of exceeding the median rainfall for our catchments. And um, if we go for a three month outlook from June through to August, potentially a 55 to 65% chance of exceeding the median rainfall. Now, what I'll show in a moment is the outlook for the same period in 2020. So June to August 2020. Because what's interesting is that while we had a 55 to 65% or while we have that, sorry, 
uh, chance of exceeding median rainfall for the coming period. For the same period last year, we had a 70 to 80% chance of exceeding median rainfall. And what we actually observed was below average rainfall in each of those months across our catchment. So June right through to August, we saw below average rainfall. It wasn't until September when we started to see near average rainfall and October when we saw above average rainfall. But this is just showing that while we can have an outlook for favourable rainfall um, conditions, it doesn't mean that that's actually what we'll see. So we consider this in our planning, but we also plan for the possibility that that rainfall doesn't eventuate. To give a snapshot of where our catchments are at at the present time, I've compared soil moisture from May this year to May last year. May last year is the blue. That's showing that soil moisture conditions were above average. And on the, um, the ready brown color, that's May this year, showing that rainfall, can, or sorry, soil moisture conditions at the present time are below average. So May last year, soil moisture was above average because of that rainfall we had in April, which we haven't seen this year. And to give you a look at what this, what this means, I've shown cumulative rainfall at Lake Belfield and Lake Wartook. So the different colours are the two reservoirs and the different styles of lines. So solids are dashed and dotted um, different years. So in 2016, as you'd expect having above average rainfall, we did see above average inflow. And um, we saw eight to 900 millimetres of rainfall at those two reservoirs between April and the end of October 2016. That resulted in 130 per cent of average inflow for that period. If you compare that with last year, April to October 2020, we sat around 600 millimetres of rainfall over that period. Now we saw 37 per cent of average inflow between April and October 2020. The difference though is that 2016 started off with quite low rainfall in April. But that caught up through the period because we saw quite consistent rainfall through May, June, July, August, September, October. Last year, we had quite good rainfall in April, which set up the catchments. So even though things might have plateaued a little bit in April, we're in a good position for rainfall in May, sorry, rainfall in June, July, August to start generating inflow to the reservoirs. Again, April this year, which is the dashed line right down the bottom, April's been dry, quite low inflows, um, quite low rainfall, makes sense. I've estimated where May rainfall might take us if we have another 15 millimetres um, from today to the end of the month. That's not gonna get us anywhere near where we were in times of rainfall, in terms of rainfall on our catchments in April and May. So we're likely to be around 100 millimetres behind where we were at the same time last year rainfall on catchments for May and April and May. So that means that if we don't see a lot of rainfall in the next um, week or two, then we're moving into June and we're going to be relying on June rainfall to continue wetting up those catchments before we see runoff and inflows. And as you can imagine, the later it gets before we see inflows to the reservoirs, likely the le less inflow that we will see. We've seen quite a few years in the last um, 10 where inflows have stopped quite early, um, some years at the end of August, some years at the end of September. So if we see inflows starting late <coughs> coupled with inflows ending early, we get quite a small volume and that translates into another dry inflow year, even though we can find that um, you know, agriculturally rainfall has been quite good, it's been a really good productive year um, for growers, but in terms of runoff to our catchments, runoffs to reservoirs, it can be quite poor. I'll touch on a couple of the climate drivers, just starting with um, Enzo Outlook, La Nina, La Nina. The La Nina event, um, the most recent one ended in March this year, and the outlook for the coming months remains neutral. The Bureau of Meteorology is indicating that, that it's unlikely that either El Nino or La Nina conditions will develop in the coming months. In terms of the Indian Ocean Dipole, so this is to do with the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures, it remained neutral right through 2020 and into 2021 so far. Climate models at the Bureau survey generally indicate that the Indian Ocean Dipole will remain neutral through the first half of winter. Um, but saying that, the outlook models have lower accuracy at this time of year. 
once we get into winter months, the accuracy of those models improves substantially. But at the present time, the advice from the Bureau is that the Indian Ocean Dipole is likely to remain neutral into winter. So what does this mean for water allocations for the coming year, um, water year financial year starting in July? Our projections are that we'll open the next water year with 0% allocation across the board. So that's by virtue of low inflows for the year gone, dry conditions at the present time, and our projection that we're not going to have very much inflow to reservoirs between now and the start of July. But if we look forward to October, so towards the end of the traditional inflow period, if we were to have inflows in the coming winter spring, similar to what we saw last year, allocations might end up around this dry inflow um, column. <coughs> so that's not a lot of allocation, um, you know, even if we do have the same inflow. 34%, um, it's, it's, it's good, but it's not great. But what that does mean is some of the lower priority entitlements, such as recreation, uh, and we have compensation flow, wetlands, <coughs> may not see any allocation if we do have lower inflows. If we do see average or better inflows, then we will see improved allocation, and there's improved probability that those entitlements will see some allocation. So what does this mean for GW Water, um, rural <coughs> pipeline customers, um, towns across the region? Well, at the present time, all our supply systems, all our town supply systems are in a good position to meet demand for the coming months. And we do a comprehensive water security assessment um, by spring each year, and that takes into consideration um, inflows that we've had, new water allocations, and the position of our water resources right across the board. And that, uh, that transpires as our annual water outlook, which is published on the 1st of December each year. So when we're doing that water security assessment, we look at where our different uh, supply systems are in terms of volumes in storage, uh, access to water allocations, and we use that to identify any potential hotspots where we may need to monitor or where we may need to take action. But at the present time and in the foreseeable future, all things are in the general monitoring zone, which is business as usual. <coughs> 